Welcome. Good afternoon to the road uh, to the Warsaw Security Forum inaugural panel. Uh, the ministerial conversation entitled The Future of the Transatlantic Alliance, New Opportunities for Europe and the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my huge pleasure to welcome our today's distinguished speakers. Among them, we have already two ministers of foreign affairs, Her Excellency Anne Linde from Sweden and His Excellency Lina Slinkevicius uh, from Lithuania. We are we awaiting moments momentarily to join us, His Excellency Anze Logar from Slovenia with a little technical uh, uh, detail. He will be uh, here any moment soon. Uh, Your Excellencies, before we begin, let me address the audience. We have almost, almost a thousand registered speakers right now, but also many more people watching us on Facebook and YouTube live. For you, I just wanted to, 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 to say, please remember about the chat option. We will be using the chat uh, in order to ask uh, questions questions to our distinguished guests, but also uh, we will have on the platform a questionnaire. We will be asking our participants, registered participants, one question. What, in your opinion, is the biggest threat to the survival of the transatlantic alliance? And of course, at the end of our today's session, I will show you the results of, uh, of exactly this questionnaire. We welcome His Excellency Anze Logar from Slovenia, who has just joined us, so I think we're all ready to go. And I will start, of course, Your Excellencies, with saying what an exciting time to talk about the transatlantic alliance uh, and our relations. The White House is most probably set to have a new resident, and that will impact the North American-European relations. But we also have so many other challenges that actually might uh, uh, we might face, and the implication will definitely go beyond uh, the current uh, electoral circle. So uh, let me start with asking all of you one question. When you look at the current state of our transatlantic alliance, what is this one thing that keeps you up at night? And let me start with Her Excellency Anne Lind. Minister. Thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I firmly believe that uh, a strong transatlantic alliance is key for both the security of Europe and the United States. Sweden is part Madam Minister, of we can't we can't hear you. Just give us a second. We're trying to check if the voice. Hello. Can you? Can you? Can I think now there is there someone who can mute because otherwise it's difficult for me to speak. I hear my own. No. I can I cannot hear, and it's. Uh, we Can have just me? muted everybody. Yes, we hear you very well, uh, Madam Minister. We've muted everybody okay, we, else. We try again because it looks like something Absolutely. is wrong on my screen, but we try again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, anyway, I firmly believe that the strong Atlantic alliance is key for both the uh, EU and the security in Europe and uh, United States. Uh, Sweden, for its part, build security in cooperation with others. Uh, as you know, Sweden is not a member of NATO and is military non-aligned. Our non-participation in military alliances serves us well and contributes to stability and security in Northern Europe. Nevertheless, our partnership with the alliance uh, is an important part of our security and defense policy. Our new total defense bill proposes a historical increase in the Swedish national defense budget. It's a 40% increase over the next five years. Yeah. This in combination with strengthened bilateral and regional cooperation on security and defense will make it possible to do our part in, for security in the Baltic Sea region and beyond. We continue to contribute to international peace operations. We have participated in all EU-led missions so far. We are currently a major troop contributor to the UN-led mission in Mali, and we'll be joining France and others with the special forces in Operation Takuba. We also are an active member of the coalition against Daesh in Iraq. 
A cause for concern, maybe keeping us up in the night, uh, is the eroding fundamental mm -hmm. principles concerning democracy and human rights around the world. The current pandemic risks uh, reinforcing this trend. This makes the world, including the Euro-Atlantic area, a more volatile and dangerous place. It can also undermine the strength of the alliances and partnerships. Here, we as Europeans have to walk the walk and uh, stand up for these norms as homes as, as well in third countries. As chairperson in office of the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe for, from, from next year, I will strive to safeguard the human dimension, the vital concept of comprehensive security and defending the European security order. Poland, as part of the Troika from 2021, will of course be an important partner in this. Mm -hmm. The OSCE Autonomous Organ Institution, not least the ODIR, which has its base in Warsaw, play an important role to support states to live up to their commitments in this field. The old saying that internal repression leads to external aggression remains true. A hopeful sign is that international cooperation and solidarity have stood the test of the current pandemic. That is true both for the European Union and NATO. These are two organizations that have proved their critics wrong. They have adapted and show a strong sense of solidarity in the crisis of historical proportions. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister, and congratulations on the OSC presidency that starts this next year. We're going to look uh, forward to that very much. But also, uh, I can already tell you that one of the options for our questionnaire about the biggest threats was the erosion of democratic principles. So, so let's see how many of our viewers will actually vote for that. But we know that, 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 that it's very good to hear that for you. That is a very important element of the essence of our transatlantic alliance. I move uh, then to uh, with the same question to His Excellency Lina Linkevicius from Lithuania, a very good friend of the Warsaw Security Forum. We always say, I think, Minister Linkevicius has not missed a single Warsaw Security Forum. Uh, so it's so great to see you back here. Uh, Your Excellency, what keeps you up at night when you look at the Transatlantic Alliance? Uh, first of all, thank you, Katarzyna, for nice words. And uh, you, you're right, indeed, there are the same suspects taking part without any break. Regardless, pandemics, so we're all together and it's good to continue this tradition. Also, I'm very happy to, to see Anne and Anja, and although it's not in person, but really good to talk. Uh, Anne told that uh, Sweden is not a member of, of NATO, but doesn't mean that Sweden cannot feel the importance of transatlantic bond. The same as all of us uh, being really strong believers in transatlantic uh, relations. And that's exactly something what I cannot say that it stays, uh, say, uh, this keeps me awake, but uh, this is really concerned that we, we have huge potential and this potential by far not, not, not used, basically. We really can address uh, threats together, we can analyze, uh, we can look at uh, risks and means how to cope with that, but we are not doing that enough. Sometimes mm -hmm. we are skipping very important uh, uh, tasks which could be addressed jointly and maybe this is the only way to do but we are not doing that so uh, what, what i'd like to say that's very important that we should be more responsible on both sides of the ocean first of all to preserving what was created the decades it's not started yesterday you know we we have this really strong alliance which started in the very difficult time and went through a crisis and proved to be very useful so we cannot ruin that. And on the other hand, it's very important to launch all these initiatives also responsibly, uh, not to widen this gap, which is also existing, let's admit, uh, not to raise mm -hmm. more doubts, so to say, maybe to build more trust. And this is important, again, I would like to stress on both sides of the ocean. Uh, when the uh, administration of President Trump criticized the Europeans, maybe it was harsh language, uh, right? But it was uh, right, right thing to say that we really should share responsibility more equally. Uh, when we are raising some initiatives in Europe, this also should be thought uh, through sufficiently in order to understand that we're getting closer together rather than uh, creating these, uh, these obstacles of uh, disbelief sometimes. And uh, here I have in mind some initiatives which could be understandable to us, uh, to Europeans, like 
PESCO, Defense Cooperation, Structural Cooperation, mm -hmm. and this is obviously important thing, and Lithuania also finding some capability gaps where we really can deliver. But in our understanding, in our thinking, not only politically, but also practically, but if you want also with regard to the taxpayers' money, we shouldn't duplicate. We shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't really uh, waste uh, resources just for the case of autonomy of actions. We have to mm -hmm. uh, really prepare packages of capabilities useful for both organizations. And for us, especially for the small country, it's really not so important. Is it NATO mission? Is it Euro European Union mission? Uh, should be some same set of forces could be used and modules should be prepared. The same certification proce procedures should be ap applied in my understanding. And regardless of uh, the organization, we really can use that. It will be really understandable for everyone, I believe. It's not understandable when duplicating, competing, uh, overlapping each other. And this concerns me, really. It's not, uh, as I said, it keeps me awake, but this is really kind of, uh, quite frustrating when we really cannot do that. So I'm talking now about technicalities, but it's also as a consequence of all that, we cannot address crisis together. And here we see the gap of leadership. Sometimes when uh, crisis emerging in various parts of, of the world, or in particular, we are concerned about our continent, of course, uh, we are not able to lead. We are able to react, sometimes doing too little, sometimes doing too late. And this is exactly the question that concerns uh, me as well. Wh why it is so? Because we really have very cap capabilities, very good, and definitely we are able to win, so to say, but we are not winning because of very strange reasons, mm -hmm. sometimes not rational at all, by mm -hmm. far not rational. So this, in short, would be my answer to your question and uh, ready to continue. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. We will be back uh, talking about the question of, of do we really need this autonomy just for the autonomy or, or you know, how important is the synergy? But before we do that, uh, let's go to His Excellency Anze Logar from Slovenia. Uh, Your Excellency, and how are you sleeping at night? Well? <laughs> well, I sleep well, thank you for asking. <laughs> And uh, definitely, there's no way that transatlantic relation would wake me up during the night. However, I have some, you know, like second thought regarding the issue, first of all, on a geostrategical uh, level. Uh, practically in every document, you have a statement that transatlantic partnership is the core of relation of the free democratic world. However, there are, you know, like some <laughs> strange, um, let's say, uh, results of, of that issue. For example, if we look from the EU side, last EU United States summit was held in 2014, six years without summit on the top political level which is, I don't think so, a right thing to do. If we stay and we agree that transatlantic partnership is of utmost importance and is the, let's say, the, the cornerstone of our relations, then apparently we should do something more in order to organize such event. That we think that it's an urgent, uh, you know, call for, uh, let's say, um, call a EU United States summit in due course, either during Portuguese presidency or during Slovenian presidency in second half of 2021, in order to have a frank discussion where we are heading. Mm -hmm. um, look, Indo-Pacific is forming a free trade agreement that will consist 30% of, of world trade. Where is free trade agreement between European Union and United States? I think it's our responsibility in order to do everything what is in our power to come closer to sign a free trade agreement mm -hmm. between two entities. If we are back in the European Union, last survey, public opinion on relation with the United States, I don't think so. It reflects the importance of transatlantic mm -hmm. cooperation. And in that sense, apparently we have a lot of things to do in order to, let's say, build trust uh, between the two entities and uh, finally form, form the, um, the unity or the cooperation that corresponds to the strategic interest, what we have together. If we took back from the United States, 
part. I mean, in a way, in recent years, they withdraw from this part of the world, from European part of the world. And I think this is a mistake because every time one superpower move away, there's another superpower mm -hmm. that steps in and it might not have the same democratical standard and the same values like mm -hmm. we have in e e EU. And I'm glad that there are new initiatives, 3Cs initiative, for example, mm -hmm. when we, we are gathering again with transatlantic partner in a very important project that is in our mutual interest. So mm -hmm. I think on both sides, there's much things to do. And I look forward for, for fruitful cooperation in the future. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. Uh, I would love to also hear uh, everybody's uh, f thoughts about the trade partnership with the United States. Yes, a free trade uh, agreement, a free trade area. I think that's also an important element. But before uh, you do that, let's go to the heart, the, 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 the most, the, 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 most uh, the question that everybody is asking uh, about the U.S. presidential election. What do you think the outcome of the U.S. presidential election is for Europe and how will it shape transatlantic relations? So I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, your, your responses on this. Uh, uh, Excellency Anne Linde. Well, thank you very much. Uh, well, I think that there are prospects for even a stronger cooperation between the EU and US uh, after the outcome of the election. Even if uh, we have had a uh, good and constructive uh, um, relation with the Trump administration when it comes to, for example, defense uh, cooperation, we have uh, last week we have special forces from the United States training with the Swedish forces here in, in, in Sweden. Uh, I still think that uh, the president-elect Biden will put some extra positive elements into the cooperation. I think, uh, for example, uh, when it comes to multilateralism, um, uh, president-elect Biden is a huge fan of uh, working together. Uh, and I think one of the most important thing is that he has said that uh, they will rejoin the Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. And that is good for the climate and for the whole world when mm -hmm. it comes to environmental issue. Also when it comes to democracy. And uh, it was uh, interesting you said that some of the young participants in, uh, in this uh, conference have said that the backsliding of democracy is one of the main issues that are keeping them mm -hmm. up at night and actually is keeping myself up uh, at night and we have a big drive for democracy where our 108 embassies and general consulates are doing different things to invigorate democracy and uh, i've taken an initiative with several other countries for friends in defense of democracy and here I think that the president-elect Biden's proposal to have a global summit mm -hmm. on democracy really could play a constructive role in uh, our relation. Another issue, of course, for me, coming from a, a feminist uh, government with a feminist foreign policy, uh, I think when it comes to uh, gender uh, uh, equality and gender issues uh, is going to be uh, much more used uh, from uh, a Biden administration, and not the least in the very important issue of women, peace and security that has the foundation in the United Nations Article 1325, and <clears throat> which I will um, work very much on the OSCE chairpersonship to let the women, peace and security agenda be horizontal in actually all different parts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So Minister Linda said more, more focus on climate change, on the question of democracy and also gender. Uh, Minister Linkevicius, uh, would you add anything to this list? And when we look at defense and the question of, of, of also deterrence of Russia, do you think anything will change here when it comes to American commitment to protecting the eastern flank of NATO? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Indeed, uh, I believe uh, let's uh, look at that realistically and what was done in the right way or right direction should be preserved. Mm -hmm. What they have in mind, uh, more presence of U.S. in our region, for instance, in Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Poland, uh, 
physical presence even, and this is really has to do with the deterrence directly. Uh, also, more 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 uh, attention to the security in general. Uh, these demands to spend sufficient uh, resources for defense, and uh, we already discussed. Maybe language was hard, but that was true. Mm -hmm. So that should be preserved. If somebody think that they now they should, they can relax and it's not so important anymore. It will be wrong. I believe message, so it shouldn't be done. Uh, and uh, along the those uh, areas where we should preserve, we have to improve a lot of things. In addition to, to what Anne said, I also agree. There are questions which were not address, addressed sufficiently or not at all even. Uh, yes, trade is put aside. It's, it's not good and we really should look for, uh, for common, common solutions. Also, in general, multilateralism uh, suffers yeah. quite a difficult time and this is, again, uh, I, I hope will be improved. Uh, also, when we're talking about um, presence in Europe, as I said, presence in our region is fine, but we always were stressing that we're not at the expense of presence in Europe in other parts. So withdrawal for Germany was uh, not welcomed by us, right, to say, to say mm -hmm. mildly. Uh, also, also uh, to jointly address uh, crises like pandemics. So withdrawal of U.S. from World uh, Health Organization was also not met with the understanding, right? And mm -hmm. now Vice President Biden told that probably he will remedy all this and to, to, to come back to the previous decision. Climate was not addressed at all, as we understood by previous administration. And here's something which concerns all of us in Europe, not only in Europe, in the world. And to solve problems of climate without U.S. will be not realistic. It's naive. So here we need to, to improve jointly address uh, uh, relations and strategies uh, with other world powers like Russia and China. Uh, what we are doing not sufficiently, we started to do that, but it's definitely by far not yet done. Uh, hybrid threats, it's really something coming from the same source uh, and uh, we should address uh, jo jointly. And, and finally, in general, these NATO-EU relations, you know, I remember when Vice President Biden, uh, representing new Obama administration, uh, Early days, he came. I was uh, serving at NATO at that time, and I remember he came as vice president, uh, one of the first visits, and he told, he was not saying what he de demands others to do, but he said, "I came to listen." I remember that. Mm -hmm. I came to listen what you're going to say, what you're going, what you're ready to do, and he came to, to NATO twice. Uh, second time, he also came to, to us to meet ambassadors and discuss issues of NATO. We know that uh, NATO is very important, and we were all concerned that it's. Uh, well, also undergoing some crisis, right? And now mm -hmm. I, I, I expect some improvement here mm -hmm. because in, yeah. in, in overall, it will not streamline relations between NATO and European Union in general, and in particular in some concrete areas, we will lose again, like mm -hmm. continuation of our previous, right? Uh, question talking mm -hmm. about previous previous uh, item you, you, you suggested. Uh, so this is also kind of continuation answering to this question. It mm -hmm. will not use this potential. We will waste resources, we will waste time, will not achieve results. And that's possible to do under uh, President Biden's uh, administration, I hope. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And uh, finally, okay. Minister uh, Logar, what is your take on the results of the U.S. presidential elections? Uh, and also, do you see hope for a free trade agreement? You began this topic. I think it's important for Europe, but also the Biden administration has said it's going to create a foreign policy for the middle class. And it will be much more, it will scrutinize much more any trade agreements uh, that would not benefit the American people. So, so what are your expectations from from the upcoming presidency? Well, I, I'm always optimistic. Mm -hmm. With that view, I think we should approach to, to always to our partners without any prejudice or without any, you know, like false expectations. Um, I, I have a rather modified view on, a, on, on a, this political situation because I'm coming from the premises that um, every, every country elects its leadership on their preferences. I mean, US constitution start with, with the people of United States, not with the people of Slovenia, but with the people of United States. So the role of diplomacy is not to, in a way, um, influence or command or try to, uh, let's say, play a story of out of the, another partner, but to take into consideration of the each diplomacy of each partner state. And in that sense, the role of diplomacy is in a way to prepare the policies that can pass forward. 
I think Slovenia, uh, uh, European Union has very, um, very detailed strategy that was very well presented during the speech of the State of the Union from the President of the European Commission, Van der Leyen. And we fully support what was there on the agenda, green, uh, digital, uh, reshoring, uh, defense, mm -hmm. and other very important issues that are in com our common interest and as well very strong transatlantic partnership. So our role of our us three and of all that are decision maker in the European Union has to do everything what is in their power in order to reach agreement with their partner in that sense with the administration of United States. And as long as we go that path, I'm optimistic and I see, I am, I'm pretty sure that we can uh, get really uh, much improvement on the, on, on the both on the relations, transatlantic relations. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, we have not only more questions from from chat coming in, but most importantly, we have two questions from the young leaders. So pl let's let's ask the young leaders for their questions first, uh, and and then we will move also to questions from chat. Hello, Ionela Acholan from Romania, alumni of the New Security Leaders Program 2018, and my question is for all the speakers. As the U.S. foreign policy moves its focus towards Asia-Pacific, how do European allies and partners see the rising global ambitions of China? Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Tomasz Obramski. I'm from Poland, and I'm a student of the Academy of Young Diplomats. Dear Excellencies, I have a question to all of you. Free Seas Initiative is one of these new opportunities for cooperation between Europe and the United States. How to invite more external partners to the project alongside the United States? How other countries from the region, like Sweden, can contribute to and benefit from the project that is enhancing interconnectivity in its neighborhood? Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I hope you heard the questions, uh, but I will uh, very shortly repeat them. The first question was about actually what should Europe do with China, having in mind that the US uh, policy probably has changed for good in terms of seeing China as a strategic threat. That's question number one. And the second about the Free Seas Initiative, which already was, was mentioned by uh, Minister Logar. How does Sweden see its potential maybe role one day in this initiative? And how how important for Lithuania and Slovenia is this initiative? So I propose we'll start from the end. Minister Logar, Logar, would you like to start with any of the two questions or both? Yeah, I mean, regarding the Sweden, I will wait for the, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, like uh, my colleague from N to, to uh, say more about it. But regarding the um, relation with China, I think that the, the European Union made a very important uh, uh, step forward uh, regarding that issue with this call for a screening of the legislative that is that is adopted within the member state states and as well with this uh, question of reciprocity um, that you know what what is required here in in our european space as well we should expect from other either you know like uh environment standard or investment standard so not that everybody come can come to european union and take whatever they want but when you want to you know acquire a company in china it's it's prohibited you can't do it so this is uh, no go for the, you know, like uh, partnership relation between two very strong entities. So I think that uh, within the European Union, uh, there is a second thought uh, regarding the relation with China. Uh, it was as well fostered with the uh, decision of US regarding the relations between United States and China. And I think we are in the middle or at the beginning of, you know, like very <laughs> difficult discussion on how to, how to build the, the, the future alliances. Uh, we have to be aware that, uh, you know, like the Indo-Pacific part of the world will not stand still. So this is another call 
of very important strategic EU transatlantic partnership that is ahead of us. And as I said, and I'm re, uh, reimpose again, that is so important that European Union and United States work together so that this democratical world uh, uh, that is based on the values present the, the, the right recipe for uh, better living of our fellow mm -hmm. citizens. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mr. Logar, uh, Mr. Linkevicius. China and free seas, two separate subjects to comment. Yes, yes thank you. Now, first of all, on Ch China, it's not a big secret that China really expanding interests around the globe in all, I would like to stress, all areas, security interests and also economic interests, and uh, sometimes using methods which are not acceptable, let's be frank. But on the other hand, we uh, also should uh, share some pra best practices and also some experience we have with this country, especially small countries like Lithuania and having uh, dealing with a big country like China. I'm always saying that it's important to have rules and where, where you're setting rules to stick to the rules. And it has to do with everything, be it politics, uh, if it goes beyond red lines, which was uh, unfortunately the case in Lithuania, where in, uh, all, all Chinese embassy was engaged in the some demonstrations, political demonstrations against uh, uh, freedom for Hong Kong, for instance, right? We mm -hmm. said it's free country, Lithuania is free country. Ever, everybody can demonstrate for whatever purpose, but should be done according to law. And you cannot be engaged as diplomats into these events. And I'm just providing as an example. So we you should note, we protested and we said it's not acceptable, it will never happen again. And that was uh, taken, by the way. Uh, second moment, like investments, right? They are also trying to invest in strategic areas, especially transport, strategic infrastructure. We have a law uh, which uh, screening the investments and uh, there are limits uh, or uh, kind of restrictions uh, to get into the strategic infrastructure uh, segments. And this is again, setting the rules and uh, they cannot do that. Uh, any other country cannot do that, right? Well, let's say 5G, we're discussing a lot about 5G, but we are not uh, talking about any particular company or country, we're talking about principles. And principles should be respected, like uh, transparency, like like respect of uh, uh, of uh, artificial so to say uh, private well mm -hmm. artificial pro property uh, intellectual property okay. like like so to say uh, trans uh, uh, like like also also com competitiveness and principles they should be respected and then it it, it works if if not again it's, uh, maybe it's a problem but it's easier when you have rules so in short uh, what we have to do and again it's related to previous. Uh, questions we discussed. It's really important uh, to discuss this among, among like-minded and, and uh, with other countries, uh, those who really already have experience and project some common strategies which, which we, we, we do not have. Let's be frank, in few few years ago, we didn't discuss China at all. Mm -hmm. Now we're discussing almost in every fora, every meeting, in European Union, in NATO, wherever. So one can say it's too late, but better later than never. So it's, it's okay, but we didn't do that before. And now it's time really to take it very seriously. Mm -hmm. So share best practices, set rules and stick to the rules. And uh, definitely to mm -hmm. spare no time to, to, to really discuss these issues in depth, uh, candidly, mm -hmm. and uh, that's the way to go. So mm -hmm. in, on China, on three Cs maybe very shortly. Uh, again, let's, uh, our hope, our expectations uh, are that uh, we will boost our, again, infrastructure projects, for instance. And the uh, US made a very substantial pledge. So Lithuania also on board, I'd like to say. We're also trying to take part and we will do that. I believe it's very important, again, the involvement of strategic partners like the United States, like Germany, like European Commission. Uh, we talked about Sweden. We'd like to see Nordic countries on board as well. That's, that would be important. And uh, this is, format will survive, uh, will work. It will have some deliverables. Uh, we'll have some tangi tangible outcome out of that. And this is possible to do, but it's up to us. Uh, if, if you're seriously enough investing and attitude very important, so it, it works. As I said, uh, for now, we are uh, in favor. We, we are supporting and we hope others will be on board as well. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Minister uh, Linda, uh, China and of course, uh, it, is there a way, place for Sweden in the Free Seas Initiative? I think Poland would welcome Sweden very warmly. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you very much. Well, the rise uh, of China is one of the greatest challenges to the world after the, the fall of the Berlin Wall. Mm -hmm. And it gives us both challenges, but also opportunities. And uh, 
the government of Sweden was presenting um, a communication on China uh, roughly a year ago to the parliament, and, and it was uh, decided in a, a, a big uh, agreement among all the political parties uh, when, it, when it comes to the handling of China. I think it's only Sweden and the Netherlands who have separate uh, national um, strategies on China. And it's building, of course, on the EU cooperation and uh, what we are doing together, because um, EU should not get caught in a strategic rivalry with, with China. Uh, EU is a, is a strong global player, uh, and we should react to, to China uh, together. Uh, the, some of the, uh, of course, uh, uh, opportunities are trade issues uh, for us. Uh, China is the biggest trading partner in, in Asia. Uh, but it's also uh, issues like Alina's was mentioning Hong Kong and what has happening uh, there with the new security law and the parliamentarians that had been uh, forced out um, uh, is something that we have to react to. We also in, in, in some countries have uh, very difficult consular cases like the prisoning of the Swedish citizen Guminai. Uh, where we have had very, very welcomed support from all EU countries, uh, both uh, from many individuals, but also EU as a whole. So I would say that there are both uh, big opportunities for cooperation, but also very big challenges. When it comes to the 3C um, uh, initiative, uh, well, we are not uh, a member of the 3C initiative. We are aware of it. We want to learn more about it. Uh, it seems like it can boost cohesion and, uh, um, and the unity. Uh, and uh, since many of those who are members are in the immediate um, area of, of us, uh, we uh, appreciate the cooperation but that would also upheld the bodies that are working very well. Um, for example, the Council of the Baltic Sea States uh, and also the Barents Council, so that uh, it's uh, complementary. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we move into the questions coming from chat from our internet platform. We have almost a thousand experts, defense security experts, but also our young leaders there. Uh, I see a question from Cyprus uh, here, uh, which is coming from Ioannis uh, Yonau. Uh, uh, he is asking, he's a founder of Geopolitical Cyprus, asking about your take on the Nagorno-Karabakh developments, the absence of uh, EU there. And of course, how would you evaluate Turkey's participation in the regional conflict. Uh, he also asks about closer relationship between Russia and, and, and Turkey. How does that affect those relations? So the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. And the second question we'll take, because we'll only have, be able to take two questions, is from Viktoria Vodichenko. And this probably is uh, most to, to Linas Linkiewicz, because I know you, you specialize in this also. But uh, the question of information warfare, hybrid warfare, artificial intelligence. The Baltic states have already had a lot of experience in trying to deal with these new type of challenges. Uh, what, uh, how can we prepare better together as the transatlantic community? Do you have any ideas what we should be doing together in these type of hybrid uh, 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 challenges that we currently have? So let's start maybe with, with Minister uh, Anlinde. I will, I will put you uh, on the spotlight here with the difficult question of Nagorno-Karabakh, but probably most importantly, the role of Turkey and the Russian-Turkish relations in this regard. And we have only seven minutes well, to go, so we will have to be very short on these answers. Okay, I'll try to be, be short. This is, of course, one of the uh, key conflicts uh, in the OSCE area. And, uh, and I uh, met, uh, I have had uh, meetings with Also with the Turkish uh, uh, foreign minister, and uh, I also uh, speak regularly to the to the uh, Russian foreign minister. Now the Armenian foreign minister has resigned, if I understand it uh, rightly, just uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, but the issue is, of course, that we want to have a peaceful and sustainable development in Nagorno-Karabakh and in between. 
uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan. And there was, uh, um, I met with the Minsk co-chairs, now I'm a little technical here, but for a very long time, Russia, United States and France has uh, been the co-chair of the Minsk group together with the Polish uh, uh, special representative, Mr. Kasperczyk, uh, on Nagorno-Karabakh. And I met him here in Stockholm um, roughly uh, 10 days ago to discuss how are we going to make uh, any peace uh, sustainable and what will be the role for the OSCE in this. Uh, because it's not good if it's only Russia and Turkey who kind of make up their minds um, and the rest of, of us in the OSCE area uh, is, is, is not engaged in keeping um, the um, p uh, uh, possible peace agreement sustainable because we don't want it to be um, military uh, again because when there is so many dead civilians already just in this rather short war. Uh, so, so that is what I have to say. We need to get more engagement from many more countries so that it's not just an agreement um, that is upheld with uh, Russia and Turkey. And that could be done in different ways. And that is one of the important issues that we have to, to discuss right now on how we will do this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, could I ask also Minister Anze Logar to comment on the question of Nagorno-Karabakh? Well, this, this is one another proof that those frozen conflict once will blow again. And it's not the solution of how to, you know, like leave the things to, to go on. Uh, apparently the Minsk group was not successful. And it was again, you know, like a uh, step in the, of the Russia that uh, in a way at the end solve for the time being the problem on expense one in, 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 in favor of another, which will not, which is not in a way the win-win situation. So that, this is definitely a call for European Union. The both countries are within the Eastern partnership. So I think that uh, it's, it's in a way one proof that we have to work with all those countries, especially there where are those frozen conflicts uh, in, in a way to uh, you know, accommodate different position mm -hmm. and with the enhancing of the living condition of uh, people in a way trying to solve the, the problem. So I think uh, the European Union should now even more focus on, on, on this part of the world in a, in a way, try to, to help Armenia and in a way find the solution uh, that will not lead for the you know permanent presentation of one army in this in, in, in those two in, in one country. Thank you very much. Uh, and the, the last word goes to Minister Linkevicius when we are in our last two minutes. So uh, please feel free to comment uh, on whatever you feel like. Uh, just keep it in yeah. two minutes. <laughs> Yeah, good, good. Uh, thank you for this. But this this issue dem demands more insight, definitely, mm -hmm. and no, not enough time. In short, the only positive thing that uh, this military encounter stopped, right? Mm -hmm. That's good. But pro problem and conflict, not yet, not solved by far. And uh, by, by the way, what, what was achieved, uh, Russia was willing to dispatch so-called peacekeepers for a long time, was not able, but now managed mm -hmm. to do that. Uh, conflict, as I said, not solved fully, so it remains. By the way, let me remind that Russia, unfortunately, creating conflicts and through the conflicts, they are mm -hmm. managing the situation. So this is not an exception here. Uh, as, I as I said, it's not fully, fully, fully solved. Um, positions of um, current Prime Minister Pashinyan weakened substantially and even new elections mm -hmm. not excluded. So that was also the lesson to those so-called public leaders because they are not very comfortable. So these examples I'm telling are really not very good. And also uh, EU was not part of the game, means group was on the side. Russia and Turkey managed the situation. And this is also some reminder that we, where we are, where is the European Union in solving all these conflicts, including this one. And then shortly, shortly on, on the disinformation. Uh, first of all, it's very important awareness. 
that to know that this is this problem exists because some time ago, seven, eight years ago, it was not easy to, to convince colleagues that this is something we should address at all. It was not understood by many. Now it's not the case. We're moving, but not sufficiently. Again, as I say, usually we are able to win this war, but we're not winning because uh, because of our capabilities are limited. So uh, let's share best practices. Let's look at that. Let's create resilience. And again, very short in the half of the minute example, where public, when NGOs are on board, when creating platforms like in Lithuania, debunk.eu, right? Screening uh, articles from potential sources of fake news. That's exactly the example when not just government, but also, also media at the expense of free time doing these things. So we have already a coalition of uh, 13 countries sharing materials, preparing beforehand, not only responding to the fake news, but also trying to create news. And this is the way to go. Seven seconds. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I'm so impressed, Minister. We do have five seconds to go. Thank you so much, I think, to all of you. Let me at the very end uh, show you also uh, the uh, the survey, the questionnaire. Uh, I think we have the results of the questionnaire. What is the threat for the survival of the transatlantic alliance that worries you most? So the biggest is internal polarization and decline of democratic standards. Uh, that's incredible. Then we have revisionist Russia. Then we have the question of rising China, and at the end, terrorism and instabilities. So here goes to Minister Anlinde. It seems that not, it's not only you who does not sleep at night over this thread. It seems like the majority of our viewers today, the participants of our platform, actually feel the same. And I think this internal reflection and the strengthening of our alliances for the commitment to our common values, rule of law, democracy, and human rights is at, at the very key. Uh, so thank you for your huge engagement today. I look forward to seeing you live, hopefully, at the War Warsaw Security Forum that we're planning for June. Let's hope that COVID will allow us to meet in person. Looking very much forward. Thank you to you. Thank you for your wonderful team's contribution. And most importantly, thank you to our viewers and participants today for your questions and for your comments also for the questionnaire. Thank you. And we will be moving right away to our next session. I'm very happy to uh, to uh, announce that our uh, next uh, session is a conversation with a special guest. We will have with us General Curtis uh, Scaparotti, the commander, uh, the former commander of US uh, European Command and NATO Supreme Allied Commander for Europe. Uh, and he will be um, discussing with Florence Gaup, the Deputy Director of the European Union Institute for Security uh, Studies, um, uh, the question of how to safeguard transatlantic unity. So we will continue continue with this topic in just a short break. Let me just add that the session is co-hosted by Lockheed Martin. So see you in a moment.